So glad you made it to the Lord's house this morning. If you have your Bibles, I read from there a moment ago, with the, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. We're going to be looking at some verses there and a couple other spots there in 1 Thessalonians. As we continue our series, Thankful. Now, I don't usually do series that go along with the holidays. I just don't usually do that, except on occasion with Christmas I do that way. But um, this series, I've not done a series on this title before ever. I'm just thinking about being thankful and being thankful in all things and being thankful all the time. And not just being thankful at Thanksgiving, which we typically tend to do. And we name our blessings then. The good old hymn, Count Your Many Blessings, name them one by one. And we only tend to do that. We count our blessings at Thanksgiving. And yet our call in life, our call as believers is to be thankful all the time, which sometimes we do okay, but here's the greatest challenge. We'll talk about it at the end of this month, being thankful for all things. We're usually very good to be thankful about the good things, but the real question is, are we thankful for the hard times, for the difficult moments? And we're going to talk about how in the world can you be thankful for those kinds of things in those kinds of situations? How can we be thankful? What in the world does that really mean? But the first Sunday of the month, we talked about being thankful for our story, being thankful for the story that God has given each of us that we're to share. And we'll talk about that here in just a moment. We're thankful for our story. You know, I remember last week's thankful for what? Anybody remember? I won't test you on two weeks ago because I know that's a fat chance. Anybody from last week thankful for what? Anybody? Please, not all at one time. Let's Let's just keep it together here. Anybody remember? It's an S word. I'll give you that much. Thankful for my season to share, right? Have a chance to share with others. Here is the example. We're going to pray over these boxes at the end of our service. But wow, thankful for our season to share. Our chance to give to all kinds of things. Why do we give? Because Christ gave to us. And then this morning we're going to talk about this third idea of being thankful for my support. We are thankful for... Christ, the greatest gift of all, but Christ set up the greatest institution of all times, the church. But I'm going to take it down to not just the church globally, but let's just take it down to our church specifically, both in our church as a whole, but take it down into life groups. We're thankful for our church. We're thankful for the support that it brings into our lives and the support we are to each other. Just a question to ask yourself, can you imagine where you would be without your church family? And if you answer the question this way, man, I don't know where I would be. I'm thankful, so thankful, then praise the Lord. But if your answer is, well, I think I'd be all right, then my question to you this morning would be this, or my challenge would you to be this, then you are not deeply connected. Because you see, I believe three truths about the church, about the support it should be in our lives. And I want to look at those three truths before we talk about the ways that church is our support. Then I'll ask Chris to come in a few moments and just share a word of testimony about how our church has been a support in his life. But think about this for a moment. Three truths. These are not rocket science. These are not things you've never heard of before. But I want to put it in perspective of the church. First of all, the first statement there on your outline is this. We were created to be in communion with our Heavenly Father. You and I, every person on planet Earth was created to be in communion with our Heavenly Father. What do we mean by communion? We're talking about a deep, personal, abiding relationship with Jesus Christ. A relationship that brings love and joy and hope and peace and contentment and purpose and fulfillment and conviction of sin and challenged by the Holy Spirit of God. And our, our opportunity in this relationship is to bring honor and glory to the name of our Savior Jesus Christ in relationship with Him. And as a result of that relationship, this communion, we are called to worship Him. And worship is part of what we do here at Sundays. But worship is also Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and the rest of the week. It is to commune with our Savior, to have a relationship, one that is vertical with our Savior. And here's the thing. Sometimes we think about worship. We oftentimes don't get worship because we forget that worship comes as a byproduct of a relationship. You see, worship is not something we do from a distance to the Lord. In fact, it's, some, it's not that we worship someone we, we don't know. We follow someone we don't have a relationship with. Uh, the best way to think about it is the, the, back in the days when there were kings and queens. And you had to worship them, right, and follow them. And did most people even know the king and queen? No. 
They had no idea the king and queen were outside of who they were, but they didn't know them personally, but yet they had a call and a command. In fact, they had no choice. They were called, you worship this person or you will pay the price. And yet our Heavenly Father, who certainly could have demanded that, who created the world. Somebody asked a great question in one of their classes. They sent me a text uh, this, this last week. Well, if God's always been, if God's first, then who created God? That's a good question, isn't it? That's one that will give you a headache, won't it? Who created God? Well, I'll tell you who created God did. God has always been. He has never been created. He is the uncreated one. That is is astounding to us. We can't really wrap our minds around that. And as a result of that, he created you and I to be in a relationship, with a loving relationship, but not one that comes out of, out of duty, but comes out of worship and service and love to know our Father intimately, to love him and know him and serve him in this relationship. You see, we forget, we get confused that worship is not, and following Christ is not about a religion. It is about a relationship. Our religion, watch this, religion in and of itself is not a bad thing, okay? Because, but here's the problem. When all we do is religion and we skip the relationship, then religion becomes dead. But when we have the relationship with Christ, then our religion, which what does this mean? How we live our lives, how it affects what we do and what we say and how we serve and how we give and how we do all those things. That is our religion, but our religion must be informed by our relationship. Are you with me on that? That's a good word. Are you with me on that? I didn't write that down. I just it, The Holy Spirit brought it to me right there. That's a good word. We're called to do the works. We're called to do all these things, but we don't do them in order to earn God's love. We do them because God loves us and out of our desire to serve Him and obey Him and be that Christ follower He's called us to be, then we go and we do what James 1.20 says. We love the widows. We love the orphans. We love those who don't know Christ. So we're called to be in communion with our Father. Secondly, we're created to be in community with one another. We are created to be in community with one another. Now, here's a great challenge because our world is increasingly trying to teach us in ways that that's not the truth. That that is not the truth, that we're not created to be in community with each other. Because we, it's designed to be isolated. It's designed to be in a place where we, don't, uh, we, we do our own thing. We're, we've talked about this often, our vision team, where, where our world is, is teaching us we don't no longer have a front porch. All we have is a back porch, Right? We have garage doors. We don't have carports anymore. We have garages with doors. We close them. We close the front door. And the, the building, you go talk to builders today. Nobody's building back porches. But they're building all kinds of front porches. They're building all kinds of back porches and back porch kitchens and back porch fire pits, which is what? Behind a fence. Designed to what? Isolate us. Protect us. Right? But you get the idea. We are called to be in relationship as Christ followers. You remember in the Garden of Eden, Adam was, we created Adam and everything was great, but Adam was alone. And so God created Eve. Not that that caught God by surprise. He had it in his perfect plan, but Adam recognizes the fact that I'm alone. I need somebody besides the Lord, though he's great and awesome and wonderful, but I, I need another human being to walk with me. And so God creates Eve. We take that even further in the fact that we're now called to be a part of the church family. And I, I want to tell you, I believe it is one of Satan's greatest attacks ever on the church in America is what he's doing right now. And let me tell you what, if we need to find a prototype, somewhere to kind of get the idea of what happens and what could happen in our churches in America, go look in Europe and Great Britain. Some of the most beautiful cathedrals ever constructed in history. They don't have any need for a sound system. These beautiful Gothic buildings, soaring ceilings, beautiful artwork, beautiful things created to be the most beautiful building in town to the worship of God. And you go to churches today in Europe and there are thousands of them. And on a Sunday morning today, they will be nothing more than a tourist attraction. There'll be no church happening. Why? Because the same thing that is happening here has already happened there. And that is this, that the church is simply a matter of convenience. It's something that if I need it, it's there. If I don't, I won't. And I want to plead with you and encourage you and challenge you that you and I were created to be in community together. And this idea that has floated around in our churches in the last several decades, and that is this, that I can be a believer and not be connected to a church, is such a falsehood, a lie out of the pits of hell itself. And I've met them before. 
Met him in Alabama regularly. Go visit and talk. And no Shave November reminds me a lot of those guys. Go visit him. Have a big old plug at the back. Well, let me tell you something, preacher. I love God. I love my country. Don't tell me I got to be in church. I can worship out there in my backyard. I can worship on the deer stand. I can worship over here, worship over there. Don't tell me I can't love God. I said, I'm not telling you. God told you. It's not me telling you because I don't have anything to say worth listening to, just to be frank and honest. I thought when I said that, I thought, wow, that well, I'll really get him in church. It's what God says that matters. And it's creeping in into our generations. To teach our children that church doesn't really matter that much. It's just the truth. That other things have greater importance. We can talk about all kinds of things that keep us. And boy, I, I wrote down a list of things in my mind and my heart. But I think when I say this, you get this. I want to encourage you to know and understand. Not because it makes me happy or makes me look good or our church look good. But I know what it means for you that Sundays in your house need to be a non-negotiable. That it is the Lord's Day. And this notion we've bought into that the Lord's Day is the Lord's Day when it's convenient, when I don't have anything else to do, and my kids don't have something to do, that it is the Lord's Day. Folks, it is the Lord's Day. And we can bless it and cover it up in all kinds of ways and spiritualize it. But at the end of the day, listen to my heart. Listen to the heart of the Father. We must be in community here. If it's your church here or in the church wherever you're a part of, you must be a part of a church family, deeply connected Amen. Some of that's an oh me, I know. I can preach on this one because I, that's easy for me. Some would say, well, that's not fair, preacher. You get paid to come. I do. I'd be here either way, but I do. But I know the lie that is creeping in into our culture. And we get afraid to step out or say something lest we offend somebody or hurt somebody's feelings. We say, well, I've got to. My, I mean, my, my, my kids, they've got to. No, no, we don't. We've got to stand up for what is right and teach our children, teach our boys. It won't always go their way. They won't always be popular. They won't always be wildly successful in the world's eyes. They might miss out on some things, but I want them to know that Christ is first and church comes right behind it. And it's not easy to do in this day and age. I know it. And the pressure is great, especially for you parents. It is great and large to not be that way. But I want to encourage you and challenge you that you make a commitment. Be a part. See, here's what we know about the church. It's like our physical bodies. There's a balance. I'll never forget I met the first time. And boy, when you get to be a preacher, you learn all kind of medical stuff. I feel like I could halfway be a doctor sometimes. All the medical stuff I've heard and listened to. And that lady, she was so sick for a long, long time. They couldn't figure out why I did all these tests. They finally realized she had these chemicals, this salt and her sodium and potassium. Salt and sodium is the same thing. Potassium and all these things, they were out of balance. Right? She was low on some and really super high on some others. They needed to bring her body back into balance. It made her sick. See, here's the problem. What you don't realize is, and what I don't realize is sometimes, is that we're not a part of the body. We think, well, they won't miss me. It's no big deal. Nobody will know. Well, let me let you know. In September and August, man, it, we were blowing and going. In October, it was like a train wreck happened. We wondered if the rapture had occurred, quite frankly. Our numbers went from 330 to like 220 for the three Sundays in October. This, served, this place was a different place, to be honest with you. It was. Well, it won't really matter if I'm not here. It does matter. You're a part of the body. And if our sodium level is low and there's 100 people not here, guess what happens? There's less here. There's less to minister. There's less to do the things that are recalled to do. See, it does make a difference when you're not here. And not only that, when you're not here, that means potentially if you, somebody that you could bring is not here. And you can't meet somebody else's needs if you're not here. You won't know about them. You won't be aware. 
Oh, we are created to be in communion with the Father. We're created to be in community with one another. And when I say community, let me be very clear about what I mean by that. And I'm going to expand this in a moment. We're called to be deeply connected. And here's our challenge, folks, and it is not easy. And we may have to make time for this in our lives. And that is to be deeply connected to know one another. On not a surface level, how are you? How are you, church? How's your life going? Pretty good? Fine, good, fine, right? It's just automatically, but that's like, just like, yes, hello. That's why I say yes, sir. It's like yes, sir, no, sir. It just comes out without even, I can't help it. Just, it's just rote. But what is it really when we ask the question, how are you really? We have to ask a secondary question. And then we get the truth, perhaps. Then somebody shares their story with us. And we have to get past this idea. It's, again, one of the reasons why we did this cardboard testimony. Because I wanted to get us past this idea that we're all perfect and we all have perfect homes. It's so fun to be a preacher and a preacher's wife sometimes. Because everybody thinks, or most of you, a lot of you think, that the preacher's marriage and his kids and his family is perfect. And I want you to know, we are not. Thank you for thinking that about me. It makes me happy. But I want you to know something. There are times, and she can amen, there are times my wife does not like me. There are times I don't like me. I know she doesn't like me. There are times when I lose my temper with my children. There are times that I don't do the right thing. There are times when there are things I should have done that I didn't do. We don't live in this beautiful little happy, woo. And I tried to be transparent with you last year when our lives got turned upside down. Something we were not expecting. And I tried to be transparent because I want you to know that I'm, I am a fellow struggler with you. I'm going to stand up here on this platform as somebody who's got it all together, who's got it all figured out and has all the answers because I don't and I don't and I don't. And we don't. So what this cardboard testimony told us was we all have skeletons in our closets. We all have challenges and issues that we face. And the challenge is that for the, your pastor is to get all of us together on the same page and say, hey, you've got that problem, well, so do they. On Wednesday night, not long ago, somebody was sharing with something and we were praying together and all, they shared something. I'm like, oh, oh, so-and-so has the same story. And I did something I don't do, I do, do often, but I, well, I do do it often that I don't think long enough about something before I do it and I get excited and I pray about it and I, and I just go and do it. I don't think to ask somebody, but I just went and grabbed this other person. I said, I know you didn't tell me I could, but I told him you had the same story. Would y'all just get together and talk about it and pray together? Because I don't have that same issue. I don't even know what that's like, but the two of you might know what it's like and y'all can talk together. You see, the one or the other didn't know the other had the problem. We all have challenges, but here's the question. Here's the challenge is we have to be able to know one another to help each other to share our stories. Well, but what if somebody knew my story? Well, God forbid somebody know your story. What better place for people to know your story than right here in the church body, right? What if somebody goes and shares my story? Let them share my story. I, folks, I cannot tell you, most of you, I think, have gotten a, a clue of what my story is in my past and what I faced in my life. But I'm even notice, I've had people tell me, well, well, preacher, you better not share that part of your story. It might really affect your ministry. I, I mean, people that I loved and respected, I looked at them and I said, well, can you expand on that what you mean? Because you're right, it will change and affect my ministry because people will know their preacher isn't perfect and didn't have a perfect life and has the hang-ups and challenges and things happened to him that weren't his fault. I know what that's like. And so you can identify that. People can go, I get that, I understand that. I can relate to that guy. I don't want you to be somebody you can't relate to. I want to be somebody that is real and authentic and transparent and that you would do the same with each other. And we quit living behind these, this bubble, this, these doors and closed doors, and we all act like we're super Christians and we have no problems. Because you know what? The lost world cannot relate to that. Can they? How can they? Look at them and go, well, I would never be like those folks at First Baptist. You know what I want to know this church is? I've gotten way off. To, well, I'm kind of on track, but I want them to know it is a hospital. This is not a cathedral of only holy people, of monks and nuns who are perfect and never do anything, who never struggle. 
No, no, they see us and understand that we are just like they are. But yet the one difference is we found Jesus Christ who has changed us from the inside out and has helped us be able to come together as a church body and share our lives and our stories together and find encouragement and help and hope and help others find the same. Yes, I get excited about that. That's what the world needs, folks. But we've, some of us have got to get out of our shell. Some of us have got to get, get off our high horse. Some of us have got to get off this impression, this notion that, oh, what if somebody knows my story? You know what happens if somebody knows your story? And I would guarantee you, some of these folks have shared their testimony. I've not asked all of them yet, but I guarantee you, some of them came up, some people had people come up to them and say, I have the same story you have. And did you know it? Did you know they had the same story before you shared your story? No. So we've got to share our story. Where do we have time to share our story? In church, in life groups, not in the sanctuary, in life groups. When we get together in smaller groups and we share our lives together. That is Christ's call on the church and on you and on me. But that takes work. That takes effort. That takes us being real and transparent. And watch this, taking the risk. Being in community takes a risk because... Oh, but what if somebody tells somebody that doesn't need to know? I'll promise you that probably will happen. Somebody will, somebody will share your need as a prayer request. Y'all know what I'm talking about? I wasn't supposed to tell anybody, but I've got a prayer request and we just need to keep on the download. Okay, if you have a prayer request and he's going to download, don't tell it. Now, sharing your life, that's a different story. Now, are we all just called to walk in and just vomit on everybody and tell everybody every detail about it? No, 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 that's not, the, that's not what we're called to do. We're called to share our lives together. Notice the third thing. And Chris, I want you to come share. Notice the third thing. We are created to help connect others to their creator and then help them connect with the community of believers. That's what we're called to do. Did you know that you have a command by the Lord to help connect others to the Creator, to the Father, to the Lord Jesus Christ? We have that call in our lives. And guess what? It's not just the preacher's call. It's all of our call, right? And it's not my call to share your story because guess what? My story is different than your story, isn't it? We all have different stories. That's what makes this body beautiful. We all have different stories. I wonder if you've written your story down. I wonder if you've had a chance to share your story with somebody. But not only do I share my story with them, watch this though. Here, here, here's the key, something maybe that we're missing. Is to share our story. They find Christ and we come alongside them and we say, now watch this. I want to get you connected in a life group with me. Well, who's in your life group? Well, I don't really know or I'm not in a life group at all. We can't help somebody connect to something we're not connected to. What is it saying? Capiche? Right? You see, we're not just called to just share Christ with them and hope they find, we want to help them get connected. If it's not here, we help them get connected somewhere else. There are tons of good churches in Pedal. Or if they're in Hattiesburg, there's tons of good churches in Hattiesburg. We can get them connected to a church body because here's what we know. If you're not connected to a church body, you will never be the Christ follower he has called you to be because you're never created to be an island. You'll never be able to practice these things that's found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, which we're probably going to have to get to next week. We're created to be in communion with our Father. We're created to be connected, deeply connected in community with one another. Community. We hear that word community, the pedal community. What does that mean? We sometimes have the misnomer of what community can mean and even what church can mean because we think community is this right here. And I want to tell you that is a small smidgen of our community. Can I tell you when our community happens? Our community happens. You know what happens? It happens right here at 9 o'clock during our life group hour. It will happen tonight. You know that will happen tonight when we get connected tonight right? It will happen at a five o'clock. We share a meal together and sit across the table from somebody who we don't, might not know. It happens on a Wednesday night at five o'clock in a life, a life group time or a, a, a supper, family supper time. It happens outside of this building. That is community and not community again of, well, I'm fine. I'm good, but a community of sharing our lives with one another. Well, how do we go to that place to do that? We have to know people. We have to trust people, which means you got to spend time with people to develop that relationship. You see where it goes. 